Welcome to The Authority File, the academic library podcast from Choice, brought to you by Project Muse and its new initiative, Muse Open. I'm Bill Mickey, the host of the podcast and the editorial director here at Choice. And during this four-part series on open monograph platforms, publications, collaborations, and business models, I'll be speaking with Wendy Queen, director of Project Muse, Barbara Klein Pope, director of the Johns Hopkins University Press, Dean Smith, director of Cornell University Press, and Saeed Chowdhury, Associate Dean for Research Data Management and Hudson Director of the Digital Research and Curation Center at the Milton S. Eisenhower Library at Johns Hopkins. This week we give you part two of the series, and I'm joined by Cornell's Dean Smith, who describes what it takes to bring out of print monographs back as open publications, and how that has specifically benefited the press. Dean also provides a great behind-the-scenes look at the workflows necessary to publish OA monographs, and why it's necessary to put these publications on a spectrum of access. Okay, so Dean, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about Cornell's Open Access Publishing Program and its partnership with Muse. Um, as I understand it, Cornell is uh, bringing influential out-of-print monographs back as OA versions through a grant from um, the NEH. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that got started and how many titles you've opened up so far? Sure. Uh, so open access at Cornell University Press consists of our participation in the NEH Humanities Open Book Program. We have 77 titles currently available on cornellopen.org and will soon be available on Project New Muse and JSTOR. Mm -hmm. we, we also participate in Knowledge Unlatched. We have 22 titles uh, in the process of being unlatched there. And we have our first sort of born digital frontless title uh, in something called Cornell Open, which is for our new our new books, and that that is also uh, launched. So about 100 titles thus far. Okay. And, and how it got started, uh, when I got to Cornell in April of 2015, um, the staff were really interested in uh, digitizing the backlist and, and, you know, had some workflows already created to, you know, clear rights and, and, you know, create metadata. So they were very hungry to want to, to want to digitize more. And I knew about these NEH grants because of what Project Muse was doing with Muse Open. So I set about to got staff together and, and we pursued that. And it's really been kind of a wonderful renaissance in terms of bringing our backlist back mm -hmm. and also looking at frontlist titles. You know, we published probably I'd say 70 out of the 140 books we publish or 150 books we publish that are very niche monographs that really can benefit from widespread uh, discoverability and access. And, you know, that's as as a publisher, that's our mission. And so that's what we're we're looking to do. But it's also really made us want to digitize everything. We have about 6000 titles. We're going to be digitizing 3000 of those. Not all will be open access, but. So that's so, oh, but open access really did inspire us to want to go, uh, deeper into that and really want to, want to do as much as we can because the scholarship, as Barbara talked about, the scholarship is valuable. And even though it's, you know, in some locker somewhere in a warehouse, <laughs> uh, we need to bring it, bring it from up under the ground and, and get it, get it out there. It's being, and it's being used. Exactly. That's, I mean, you've, you've got a, it sounds like a pretty ambitious um, um, plan going forward. And, and I, I want to dip in a little bit into sort of um, how you guys actually um, make a title open access um, in terms of um, what it might cost, um, you know, what the grant covers, um, you know, what you're prepared possibly to lose on, on the back end of this. But, um, you know, I, I know quote-unquote business models are different for each press when with regard to OA and, and there's a variety of ways of approaching this but maybe just specific to you guys Dean you know what does it cost to make an out-of-print title open access um, you know and what what is the grant covering for you guys specifically sure so you know in, in talking about the business model the business model for the traditional monograph isn't working anymore so mm. um, I'm I think probably already losing on on those books that we're doing, but 
I estimate it it probably cost us about three thousand dollars per title. And so and, and by that I'm only talking about the seventy seven NEH Humanities Open Book titles. Mm-hmm. So and with each grant, a percentage of that grant, about twenty percent, goes directly into the university grant fund, um, you know, for for overheads and other things. So that reduces the size of the grant. Um, but we have about eight people meeting every two weeks to deal with this program. Uh, okay. We did we did twenty books in the first iteration, and that felt manageable. And when we do these books, we bring the digital version out as open access, but we also create a print paperback. The authors really like that, which we sell. Mm -hmm. Um, So there are workflows associated with that. And at one point I had to say, you know, what's really most important is that the eBooks get out and are, and are open first. And then the, the the paperbacks can come down in the workflow. Those don't need to be simultaneous. Those can come out when time permits, because we're already doing um, you know, 140, 150 other books a year. So that it does put some stress on the staff. So, um, like I said, estimated it's probably, you know, about $3,000 per title. And what goes into that? We also do a Kindle version. So there's composition costs and there's marketing costs and there's, you know, the costs of, of, you know, just labor costs. And, you know, all of those eight people are engaged in doing some aspect of that, including myself. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, we in the rights clearance process, there's correspondence that goes out. There's contract addendums. There's, you know, going back and forth with the authors to explain the benefits of the program. Right. Uh, one of the big things for us is metadata creation because our data for those older titles is in such not great shape, let's just say. And so that <laughs> that causes a whole different set of, of things to go on where we're recreating copy. We're, you know, we're not doing a whole lot of that, but we... You know, if it's in a file, it's got to be, you know, retyped in, those kind of things. And we want that copy to be really robust because, especially if it's one of the classic works that, that you know, we want to capture as much of, of, you know, the the best parts of these publications as possible. And the paperback version where a new mechanical for the cover has to be made. And, you know, we do things at Cornell. It, it, we're very thorough. We, you know, we carefully edit, copy edit, market Everything we do that has our brand on it has to be done a certain way, and right. the, the staff takes tremendous pride in that. So I'd say about I think you know three thousand, and I'm I'm not so concerned about you know we might be you know losing ten to fifteen thousand here or there. Um, our composition vendor has given us a break on some of the composition costs for these titles because we've made the pitch that we're not selling these. You're still getting that same level of business from us, so it's it's really forced us to rethink some of our relationships with our vendors too. And that's worked out. So I'd say, um, you know, we're probably losing, uh, you know, a little bit when you, when you're all in, when you look at overheads as well. Right. But I think what it gets us in terms of really binding ourselves to a new audience to be able to see and, and monitor and measure what this, what's actually happening with these books to be able to work with Project Muse and JSTOR. And Hathi Trust and, you know, the dictionary, dictionary of open access books and, you know, puts us out there in a different, a different way. Um, and gets us thinking, all of us collectively, this, this kind of led to Knowledge Unlatched too, where our editor in chief said, Hey, why don't we try this too? It's a way to get a subvention for a book if these are unlatched. So it's, it's kind of caused a lot of thinking that I do think we will ultimately break even and even profit from, from down the road. Muse Open is an initiative to distribute open access monographs on the Project Muse platform with a best-in-class, scholar-informed user experience. Supported by a grant of nearly $1 million from the Mellon Foundation, Project Muse's goal is to deliver OA monographs that will be broadly shared, widely discoverable, and richly linked. Through collaboration with its participating publishers, hundreds of books will be freely available on Muse when it launches its newly redesigned platform this summer. Muse Open amplifies Muse's commitment to the scholarly community with OA monographs that are visible, fully integrated in the research process, and potentially transformative on their trusted and highly diversified platform. To find out more, go to muse.jhu.edu slash museopen and follow Project Muse on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Don't want to be afraid. 
longer term, it sounds like, you know, that, that part where, you know, that aspect of that you're not really breaking even or, or generating even a modest profit so far on, on many of these titles, but it is fulfilling the mission. We're even um, expanding on the mission of the press in terms of getting, getting the research out to more people and um, expanding reach and that kind of thing. Well, when we first started this, I thought the 150th anniversary of Cornell University Press is in 18, well, it was started in 1869, so it's in 2019, and I wanted 150 open access books to celebrate that anniversary. Also, mm-hmm. to celebrate on campus what was in 2016 a new century for the humanities, you know, a refocus on humanities at Cornell. And I'd like these books, especially our literary criticism titles, to be used in courses at Cornell or in any courses. So I'm working with lyricists and other large academic consortia to actually have access to these titles, to send out uh, marketing for these titles so that they can be used in, in whatever, you know, history departments, English departments, as, as course titles, because then that, that introduces a new generation of scholars to these classic works, which is really past, present, and future. It puts it all together for us. And, you know, that's a way that the university gets its brand out there. You know, these mm-hmm. are, these are many of these published in areas that, that the university may or may not be strong in. Certainly literary criticism it is, so it's a good fit. But Slavic studies and medieval literature, not so, you know, that's, that's not necessarily the case. So it extends that brand globally for our titles. And that's the, you know, I think that's really what university presses should be doing today. I mean, that's, that's, you know, Forget about the basketball team or the football team or whatever. This <laughs> it's about widespread dissemination. It should be, you know, spreading knowledge. So exactly. Um, I wanted to get your take on this as we as we kind of mentioned earlier. Um, um, open access doesn't have to fall into this sort of quote unquote binary definition. Uh, it's either open or it's not kind of thing. But rather, you know, OA can be on a can be a spectrum of access. Um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that i mean one of the frequent quibbles i guess between librarians and publishers is on what exactly constitutes an open publication uh librarians often contend that unless a work is totally ccby licensed it's not really open with a capital o um but publishers and i think authors too um sometimes prefer a ccby nc or nd license um and I'm wondering if you could provide a little bit of insight in how you navigate that difference of opinion um, at Cornell. Sure. Uh, you know, certainly we want to be as open as possible, but we take feedback from our authors. And, and you know, we – we I think Barbara hit the nail on the head, basically. Is that these, these are the beginning days for humanities and open access. And right. as it begins to evolve, you're going to see more openness. But we like to – do things in, in a slightly more restrictive way, uh, at the outset just to see what, you know, well, where is it being used and what are the centers of, of excellence that are using these titles? Where is it being used? And, and for even publishers and authors to get more comfortable with this idea, you know, we don't even, we don't have authors banging down the door for, to do open access. So we'd like to get everybody comfortable with this model or this approach and learn from it before we just say, Hey, here's our live gen site with, you know, 8 million pirated titles that are now open access. I mean, you know, that, that's, um, not, and I don't like, you know, I think I've been at this open access, you know, in, in this environment since my career in SDM publishing, similar to Barbara, mm-hmm. where, where it happened a lot earlier. And there was, you know, there was a lot of fervor, um, in terms of open versus not open repository versus not repository. And I, I want to avoid all of that polarism as much as I can because I think we just want to we want to step through this do the next kind of right thing that makes sense for for us and and for our authors and 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 continue to build and not and not you know I I don't want to have it be you know one end of the spectrum or not I think the middle ground is really a smart way to go exactly um since you've had you know quite a bit of experience already at this I'm wondering um, we've talked a little bit about the importance of um, discovery for, for OA monographs. Um, can you talk about some of the engagement metrics um, that are coming out of your OA, OA efforts so far, um, particularly with the Signal series and later with the um, 
NEH funded efforts that you you've been undergoing? Sure, our Signale studies in German, it's in uh, Signale series in German studies. We've published about eighteen titles, and after four years, those books go open access. And what we've been able to see there, that was really our first OA program um, that started in two thousand and ten, and that also was one of the foundations for that you know that, that really inspired us to to move in this direction. But those titles see three to four times the usage of the, the ones that go OA after four years have now had three to four times the usage of the ones that have been, that are still behind, uh, you know, the gate that are still gated. So mm -hmm. that's encouraging in terms of chapter downloads is what we're looking at there. Okay. Now, and when, when you move over to NEH and we're looking at that, that, the usage there has been profound. And, and I think it really has to do with the way these books were selected in terms of working with Cornell Library and Kaiser Walker to create a methodology with subject area specialists and um, some faculty and, you know, looking at citations and different things. The filter at the beginning, at the top of the funnel, I think really helped us select some great books. And, you know, in 2017 alone, our, our books through Project Muse and JSTOR were – Accessible in 125 countries, in 12,000 institutions, um, over 230,000 chapter views and article downloads. The majority, more than 50% of those, 50 to 60% of those are Project Muse generated, um, which is really, to me, is extraordinary. Our own site, Cornell Open, had 10,000 uh, chapter views, chapter downloads. Um, and one of the really surprising things to me, and, and I have some new metrics on this, is we put the books on Kindle free of charge as a download, and we've seen nine to ten thousand full book Kindle downloads of these titles. And when I'm referring to the, the initial twenty that we did with NEH, but the fifty-seven that we've just launched pretty much last week, they, they've already generated a thousand Kindle downloads in two to three weeks. I don't know, you know, when you talk about discovery, maybe Amazon has it figured out, but people are finding these titles and downloading them. And we haven't even officially launched the, these these titles yet. So, um, you know, and, and that gives me that's encouraging. I don't know if the scholars that we contacted um, initially are, are watching the site or going there and making, you know, or the librarians that we contacted are, are. But these books are being downloaded. They're in our top, you know, for the month of March. They're in eight or ten of these titles uh, out of the fifty-seven are in the top downloads for the month. So. Mm. You know, it's encouraging, and I, you know, I don't know what it means. I don't know if it's a lot or if it's a little. We're, we're still at the early stages, and but certainly that's the idea: is that these are, you know, basically pulling them out of the cave and putting them, uh, you know, out there. It, it, it seems to at least be generating uh, the some activity. So. Right. No, that you're you're that is really impressive and, and indeed promising. And I'm wondering, uh, it, you said it's a little bit early still, but um, you know, are there any kinds of um, initial um, ideas or that are or, or sort of strategic directions or impulses that are coming out of these metrics and engagement metrics that you've been tracking um, that might inform sort of a longer term approach to your OA strategies. Um, I mean, you mentioned earlier that it seems to help that uh, perhaps taking a more curatorial approach to title selection and creation could create some more success down the line but um you know what are some of the things that these metrics are telling you in terms of what you might be doing in the future i mean i think in general we want to be you know if if there are funds available through you know the the tome program or, or other programs we want to be ready with the the systems in place to handle those and in working with our partners project muse and jstor and others you know, basically, initially, that's what we wanted to be really ready to do. But now it's kind of given us the idea that we want to, we actually want to go look at some of our early science titles. You know, we're the nation's first university press. We published Linus Pauling's The Nature of Chem the Chemical Bond. That's open access now. We still sell that every year. But there are other science titles that we want to maybe bring back that would have a long tail. Uh, what, what's really, it's like this content just has a, humanities content has a long tail and it it hasn't really prompted us to move into other disciplines, but it may actually help us keep things like Slavic studies alive and mm -hmm. medieval literature and some of these titles that we've brought back where we're seeing a lot of usage. And even, you know, 
even our work, you know, in, in, in our program, at, you know, in literature, you know, literary theory, you know, that's, that's purely monographic. That's, you know, you're not looking to do that because it's going to pay for the publication of other books. But you know what? It really gives us what, you know, we were at the MLA, Modern Language Association, in January, and the people that were coming and taking the paperbacks of these open access books and just really feeling energized uh, about Cornell Press because we brought these back and made, you know, I, I read that when I was an undergrad or I read that when I was, you know, that's the kind of connection you want to make. And, you know, we want to try that, you know, conference experiment where we've got the paperbacks there and, you know, just to see we sold them for five dollars, I think, you know, and right. it just that helps, you know, maybe you feel like you want to bring your manuscript to, to Cornell because of that. Or you, you see, you know, in a lot of ways you want to do the right thing. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, we're all trying to survive, but doing the right thing, I think, is important. Right. Yeah, and I'm sure just going back to the metrics real quick, I mean, I'm, I, I would assume that those, some robust metrics that, that signal success, um, that, that OA is actually um, helping in that regard, that, that the metrics seem critical to the future success of, of OA monographs as well, that, that be, that's going to become an, a very important um, component to this whole thing. Uh, the other thing, you, you know, also in as sort of an extended answer to the, the previous question is, I, I'm ready to now go for even bigger grants to do more of this because mm-hmm. I think that, you know, we could, we could really do something profound in a hundred titles maybe at one time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with some more funding and, and I would love to find somebody to fund you know, the opening of our, you know, I have that in my little, my donor dossier, like here's a program you could invest in, uh, bring it all back and we'll open it up for this amount, you know, this price and, and you know, or whatever. But that's sort of the big dream. I don't know if that'll happen, but um, why not dream big? I mean, you know, it's scholarship and it's been published and it's worth, it, it's got a lot of value to it. And I think it's for the betterment of humanity. I think Barbara really did a nice job of hinting at that and Wendy as well. You just heard from Dean Smith. This concludes episode 35, the second of four episodes on open monograph platforms, publication, collaborations, and business models. This episode was brought to you by Project Muse. Be sure to join us for the next episode where we talk with Saeed Chowdhury of the Sheridan Libraries at Johns Hopkins about the innovative collaboration between JHU's libraries, Muse Open, and researchers to create a new open access publication called Black Press in America. The Black Press in America is really an inspiration from Professor Kim Gallen at Purdue. Uh, she's an assistant professor of history. Uh, she's also the leader of something called the Black Press Research Collective, which is a group of scholars that are examining African American newspapers uh, and fundamentally exploring the African American experience from their own viewpoint using their own voices. Find all of the episodes of The Authority File on your favorite podcast app or on our website, choice360.org. Just click on the librarianship drop down. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us.